talking a little bit about some of the work I did in Facebook. Uh, this is about a couple of years back, so specifically around the architecture of the Facebook messaging uh, system. So uh, just to sort of uh, uh, you know put some context on the talk, um, the, what you experience, you know, use as the Facebook messaging system actually used to be the chat system and then the, there was a separate sort of messaging system and at some point you know they were unified. So what, what I'm going to be covering this talk is not the chat system but specifically focus on the re-architecture of the messaging uh, backend um, which used to be based on MySQL uh, and was you know written very differently to a more sort of a modern uh, implementation. Um, so one thing I want to make clear, I'm not a Facebook employee anymore. Uh, I, I left Facebook last year so I'm just going to be talking about uh, a brief period of six months where I was one of the key participants uh, in the design team uh, that sort of you know came up with the design. Um, there is a lot of material on the net that you would find uh, uh, and I've tried to like not repeat that stuff like uh, uh, there's a publication uh, I think um, in June in ICD there's a publication by the edge based team in Facebook. Uh, there have been uh, Facebook engineering blog posts and stuff uh, so there's a lot of stuff you know background material that you can find on the web for free. Um, I'll try to uh, lend a little bit of insight into how we came to our decision point rather than uh, uh, try to focus a lot on the implementation because I was actually not uh, you know, part of the implementation. I moved on to other projects. Right. So having said that, um, th this is a pretty hard problem. Um, uh, I mean, of, you know, we've been hearing about a lot of hard problems and uh, this is definitely up there uh, amongst the hardest ones. Uh, the stats are very simple, you know, we, Facebook obviously wants to be uh, 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 serve everybody on the earth, I mean, so we were at least projecting, hey, you know, we'll have billion users in short order and that is obviously uh, almost true, I guess. And even if you take very moderate usages of any emailing kind of system, right, so I put some like example numbers, uh, you know, 25 messages per day for every user. Um, assume that every message is four kilobytes and even just forget about the chat attachments, the photos and Excel, Word, whatever people are sending around, right? Uh, so, you know, just do the math, hey, it's about 10 terabytes a day, right? Just the message bodies. Um, okay, so now, but that's, that's not it, right? I mean, if all your messages were just stored in one gigantic file, you still wouldn't be able to access them and actually uh, give you the email interface that, you know, you're all sort of familiar with. So, uh, we have to add some indexes. You know, you have to um, maintain threads like Gmail uh, in Facebook. What uh, I think they do today is sort of uh, there's an implicit thread for every uh, friend. So you see all messages from the friend sort of uh, in a chain, and there would be threads for like you know groups of people communicating. So there is this notion of threads, and you have to maintain indexes. What are the messages uh, in that thread? Uh, you have to you know provide search. So that means you have to maintain a keyword index. Uh, you have to maintain all these counts, right? So how many, like, we log in and we, we expect to see uh, an unread message count uh, overall. We want to see, like, on every thread, like, how many messages are there, how many are unread, and so on and so forth. So, so there's a variety of sort of, like, indexes and summaries that you have to compute on the base data. And then once you start adding in those, like, you realize that the actual amount of data that you'd have to store is, like, even uh, 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 much more than, uh, you know, just 10 terabytes a day, um, right? So. So beyond the scale, the amount of data, the volume of the data, the other aspect, you know, these are standard aspects for any company is that we want the data to be replicated to some remote data center so that it's available when, uh, you know, uh, uh, if the primary one goes down. So ideally we want to be able to concurrently update data from different data centers uh, so that no matter, you know, whether you're logging in from India or you're logging in from Europe or uh, America, uh, you might be hitting the data center that's closest to you and actually we can sort of make updates there. And uh, uh, so I think in the summary, uh, I, I, we, we probably mentioned that this talk might cover consistency, the cap stuff, right? Uh, and this is very, where it starts getting really hairy, right? I mean, so uh, um, this is a hard problem, right? Doing concurrent updates is very hard, but anyway, uh, the minimum we want is that there should be a copy of data somewhere else. Uh, in the case of disaster, we should be able to recover, right? Uh, the other uh, thing I wanted to mention was, um, uh, uh, you know, we talk about availability all the time, failures, five nines, four nines, right? Um, one of the, the things that people really liked internally at Facebook was that it's not that things didn't go down, right? So uh, I think we had at, um, like at the time of my leaving, like maybe like 5,000 databases or so. And wh what I used to hear was that every day uh, we would uh, sort of lose three or four of those databases. They would just like burn and crash. 
and then somebody would actually, uh, you know, bring up a replica manually. You know, it was kind of not automated. But none of you guys know about it, and none of you guys care about it. From your point of view, like, service seems to be mostly up. So the, the reality of the, you know, the market is that, like, if you bring down, like, 1% of your service, uh, nobody really cares, right? Uh, uh, but if you bring down your entire service for five minutes, uh, you'll get headlines in New York Times, you know, like Facebook goes down, Amazon goes down, and so on and so forth, right? So, um, so we wanted to design the system, you know, that this has to be a design requirement, is that uh, the, the, the system, you know, should never crash in its entirety. You know, it should, it should always have sort of like independent points of failure. And it's okay if like some things are offline. I mean, that's kind of like okay. But uh, losing all of it is not okay. Uh, and uh, the, the overriding, you know, concern was, um, can't lose data. I mean, so if you are going to, <laughs> if there's one way sort of uh, you're going to undermine uh, people's confidence in your messaging system, it is to, you know, end up losing data. So that, had, that, had, that was sort of like priority number one. Uh, things that we did not have to solve, and I bought, uh, bought up the point about uh, uh, photos that, you know, we, I just took that out of the equation. And the reason was that uh, there's a system in Facebook already that's called Haystack. Again, you know, you can find a lot of documentation online. Um, it's uh, globally distributed. Uh, distributed in a data center, it just scales out leniently, and it's something that they've perfected, you know, it's kind of just works, right, at this point, because Facebook is by far the largest photo store in the world. So the idea was that, hey, you know, any attachment data, like, we'll just throw it there, and, like, let's not worry about that problem. Uh, the other key thing I want to highlight here, uh, and I cannot stress this uh, hard enough, is that uh, please take anything I say here with a grain of salt, because not all companies uh, have the choice of talent and, uh, you know, engineering skill and bandwidth that Facebook had. So our charter was that, uh, hey, you know, find the best design, you know, something that is rock solid, that's going to scale to billion, two billion users. Uh, don't worry about whether it works today. I mean, you're worried to a certain extent, but, you know, uh, you can't start off with something that is completely broken in concept, but if it's not perfect, if it needs features, then hey, you know, we, we can hire like anybody we want, and we can get that uh, built out. And that's uh, very different from, you know, like an average startup, uh, uh, you know, we, we've got to choose something that just works, right? Um, and, and getting things done fast. So this, this is another sort of like, you know, the, always a tension between, hey, getting things perfect versus uh, sort of moving fast is like the, the religion at Facebook. Uh, you've got to do things fast, including, you know, the fact that the product changes. So, uh, you know, Zuck would just sort of like dream up something and, and tomorrow, like, he'll say, okay, you know, guys, I want the ship like in two weeks or something, right? And you've got to do it at that point. So that's sort of the, the context here. Uh, so let me move on to uh, some of the uh, uh, more detailed sort of point by point, you know. How, so uh, if you go and, uh, uh, like, uh, look up online documentation, you will find that we, we ultimately settled on edge base and I'll describe some of the other components, but, you know, how did we get to that point? So the first point that I think everybody uh, in the, uh, so there was a small team of like six people, there was a lot of conflict, everybody had different ideas, you know, stuff, but I think everybody agreed that whatever we chose had to have, you know, stupendous right throughput, because we're going to have like email system, you know, messages pouring in like crazy. Uh, we did not even cover spam. So, for example, if you go to Yahoo Mail, you will actually see like a you know ton of spam that they don't throw away. You know, they hold it on for a month or so. So, maybe that 25 messages per day was actually something realistic for um, um, genuine messages. But actually, if you can include scam, even more. So, so tremendous right throughput. Uh, there were only two choices. If you were going to go with a disk-based solution, uh, you had to have a log-structured uh, data structure to store data fast, right? So there have been, you know, uh, talks here that have talked about this, that, you know, you can do buffering and async and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, uh, if you want to store data really uh, fast on disk, you need a log structured container. Um, um, uh, again, you know, like tons of papers around. I'll talk a little bit about what we chose. Um, one of the things, uh, and so there's another way, right, which is like, okay, let's just put everything in flash. And one of the designs that emerged internally at Facebook was this very clever design where um, it was argued that, hey, um, if you look at your mailbox, uh, let's say it has, you know, 10,000 messages or even like 20,000 messages, right? Uh, if you just stored the metadata, right, uh, what time it came, um, um, who was it from, like just basic metadata, right? Um, it, it's not that much data, right? And so maybe, hey, you know, we could just like store uh, every mailbox, just the metadata of every mailbox uh, in Flash, right? Uh, and potentially sort of combined with memory and it will be done, right? Uh, and um, uh, that, that might actually be a, uh, an interesting solution, and I think it will get more and more tractable as sort of uh, flash prices go down. 
but the the trouble is that it kind of puts you in a bind. You know, you can only store so much. And uh, I'll take a very simple example. Uh, uh, let's say you know when you uh, am I dropping off? Yeah, okay. So um, when you open up your mailbox uh, or any thread, you know you'll see a bunch of messages sort of like just pre-opened for you. You know, uh, it makes no sense to force you to click on every one of those. If you were implementing the back end of such a system, you would think that hey, you know, I, I should like in one I/O or in you know one request just pull down like a bunch of stuff that the user wants to see in a single page view, right? Um, so with, with storing things on disk, you know, you get this flexibility. You can sort of start storing, uh, you know, more stuff in line, small messages instead of just the metadata. You can pull it all out and show it to the user really fast. Uh, and in some ways in the Flash solution, you were sort of punting the problem of like, okay, okay so you got all these like 4K really, really small messages, then who the hell is going to store that, right? Um, so, and the key, the indexing is the other part. I mean, you have to have the index. So, like. Again, you know, you can do bitmap indexes very e efficiently, but it's very tricky to get it right with a general purpose uh, keyword index. Uh, all right, so moving on, more uh, sort of deep down stuff. So like, I wanted to show you this diagram. There's this thing called LSM trees. Uh, I, I'm sure like many people in the audience are sort of aware who have looked at these systems. But if you're not, like, uh, the, the, the way it differs from a traditional database like RDBMS is that instead of storing one tree of all the data and having pointers from the root down to the leaf nodes, it stores things as a set of trees. And the advantage is that uh, as data comes in, you don't have to uh, update older data. You just sort of like, you know, the data just comes in and sits here, right? And then asynchronously in the background, you go and merge it and, uh, you know, all the, all, the, all the hard stuff you sort of punt. Okay, I'll do it later on. Um, there's a lot of follow-on work from this paper, but this is pretty much the standard design pattern for log-structured databases, and uh, very high write throughput because you're never accessing uh, disk randomly, right? So you're just sort of like piling on at the uh, at the front of your sort of like uh, free space or whatever, right? Uh, one of the the, the 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 coolest things about this is that it matches the uh, messaging system requirements very well. Uh, the reason is that if you think about it, uh, you know, when you open your mailbox, you tend to access things that you uh, messages that you got recently or, um, you know, even old threads, right? Threads that got a new message, right? Those are the ones that you would sort of click. Uh, and guess where those things live, right? Everything that got updated recently or that was just created recently lives in the head of this pile, right? It, in, a, in a small separate data structure. That means in theory, uh, if you were to get this organization right, then you could cluster everything that you need in a small part of your disk system and read that off very efficiently. Um, so uh, the yeah so 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 the, the interesting part was that I think when we looked at the mailbox problem and we thought what the ideal disk organization should be, it was almost exactly LSM trees. And so we said, okay, let's find a system that you know is built around this kind of concept and uh, uh, go with that. So and uh, as again many of you know, uh, Bigtable was the one uh, you know the most famous system that sort of used LSM trees, and then uh, EdgeBase and Cassandra both sort of uh, you know were built around LSM trees. Uh, there are also, by the way, for MySQL users, there's Tokutek DB, and there's a bunch of other sort of like storage engines that are now sort of like, you know, based off this pattern. Um, this, uh, this data structure is inherently snapshotted, so the, the last tree that lives on the, you know, on, on I guess your uh, rightmost side is, uh, holds the entire data, and like every day you can just like take the, the oldest tree and just shovel it somewhere, it's like your uh, NetApp snapshot or something like that, right? So it's, it's, it's very easy to back up. So moving on quickly, I don't have much time. Uh, the problem with the system is that reads are, uh, you know, writes are cheap, reads are expensive. Because the reason is that every time you come and ask a question, hey, you know, do you have this key? Now instead of a traditional database that just sort of like goes down from the root of the tree and goes down to the leaf and finds it or misses it, now you've got to answer this question for every tree that you have in your system. And people have invented clever ways like bloom filters and stuff, but no matter what you do, you cannot get away from the fact that this is not a read optimized system. So uh, the, 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 the solution then was that, um, okay, so, uh, you know, this is great for high write throughput, for read throughput, let's, uh, you know, build an application server on top of this data store, and let's um, keep, a, a, you know, a very well-tuned cache of, uh, you know, everything that's required to serve user page views and uh, mailbox views uh, in that app server. Um, now, once you start doing caching, you have cache coherency issues, so, you know, again, just to keep things simple, like, so just come up with a very simple, uh, policy, let's just have, uh, let's have users bind to app servers, right? So all updates to the mailbox, all reads to the mailbox are going through this one app server that also holds a very nice in-memory cache, 
and no cache currency issues. The only th problem we have to solve is, given a user, we have to find out uh, uh, which uh, app server the user is hosted on. Right? Um, so uh, the solution to this, I mean, we knew how to solve this, but like the actual solution was done after I left. So I, I think uh, right now, if you read the papers, you'll see that there is a user discovery service that's written in Zookeeper. So that is responsible for maintaining uh, this mapping. Um, the other, again, you know, going back to the lesson trees, one of my favorite topics is that, like, if you think about, like, uh, a user logging back in after a long time, and you don't have the cache is completely cold, right? So how do you construct this cache? How do you populate this cache? And if you were dumb about it, you could, like, that could take a lot of hit, right? Um, uh, but again, you know, if you think about it from that, the tree organization I showed you, you would realize that most of the data you need is actually going to be living in one of those uh, trees. And so you could, if you were smart, sort of like just uh, scan the first tree or the first few trees and pretty much load everything that you would need to render a user's mailbox. Um, no single point of failure, you know, don't want to take everything down, uh, but HDFS, as I don't know if people have mentioned, uh, is a single name node, it has, doesn't have high availability, so I said, okay, but that's not too hard, right? I mean, so we just like, you know, instead of having like one gigantic HDFS, and edge base instance with like petabytes of data, let's have like small ones, right? So, so I think the current deployment has something like 100 node uh, edge base uh, sort of uh, clusters. And I believe, you know, over time we've also added name node HA, but given the inherently sort of like the federated and the partitioned nature of the deployment, they actually don't care about it that much. I mean, this is kind of almost ironical. Um, so, uh, so you know, okay, we decided the data structure. We know that it has to be distributed. Uh, so we have a choice, right? So we can do Cassandra or HBase. And there was also at the time, uh, and even now, I think there's uh, Hypertable is another sort of good choice from a log structured sort of a distributed data store point of view. Uh, I didn't write it up because uh, Hypertable's ecosystem is not that you know uh, popular or whatever. Uh, so these these were the two sort of main systems. So in a nutshell, I don't know whether I'll be able to go in and sort of go this uh, deep into this. Uh, we tested things out, you know, that was the only, uh, we were in a mad scramble, you know, trying to sort of get things out. We had to get the design right, but we actually, actually had to ship things as well. So, tried out HBase, tried out Cassandra, uh, big caveat, we tried out, this is 2010, everything has changed since then. Uh, we tried out Facebook's internal version of Cassandra, not the open source tree, and, you know, maybe that was a mistake. Uh, but in our testing, uh, we had a really poor time with Cassandra. And uh, this is just within a data center, it's not sort of across data centers and stuff. Okay. Um, then uh, what happened was that uh, while we were doing all this, we said, okay, we really want to understand what's going on inside, inside Cassandra. So we started looking, reading the papers, we started diving deep down in the code, and I'll try and uh, uh, go a little bit more deep into this, but for our use case, again, you know, big if, like, I mean, if, but, like, for us, HBase was the better choice, Cassandra wasn't. Um, the, another thing that, you know, I talked about, like, no data loss. So one of the big worries we had was, man, like, I mean, if, like, we screwed up, like, if we chose a system that, like, ended up losing data, like, uh, basically, we'll be all fired, right? It's pretty simple. So, uh, but we really trusted uh, HDFS. So, you know, it has its issues. It doesn't have HA. It's kind of slow, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, we had stored, like, petabytes and petabytes on it for, like, almost a couple of years when we were doing this evaluation. And we had never suffered any loss. And uh, so... In the spectrum of things we could think of, and I think um, Pramod was just talking that, you know, of all the things that they looked at, MySQL was the most rock solid thing. And we had that kind of same philosophy that, okay, we really, really trust MySQL, but if you're going to trust anything after MySQL, probably it was HDFS. And that definitely tilted the playing field quite a bit. Um, and, you know, again, sort of to reiterate, like, we could hire engineers, you know, we could hire committers, whatever, right? So, so the main thing was we could, we could build out all the missing features of which there were a lot. So talked about disaster recovery. Uh, I, one of the things uh, that I really love about EdgeBase, uh, uh, and this is common to like many database technologies, is that uh, it's really easy to do backups, right? So you got an inherently snapshotted system. Uh, what you do is every night you take your sort of like the full compacted snapshot tree of your entire system, you ship it off to a remote data center. And you're also shipping uh, your uh, right ahead logs, uh, the transaction log that's uh, storing the changes in the, the, in the database. Uh, you're also shipping that to a, a remote data center. And every night, once you have shipped the, your sort of, you know, the full compacted snapshot, you just truncate your log because you don't need the stuff that is already reflected in your snapshot. And this is so easy to do. You know, you can just probably write a Python script around it. Um, you don't even have to get it right. You, know, you don't have to synchronize number two and number three. As long as number three is before number two, I mean, you... you you don't drop off things that have not been reflected in the snapshot, you're okay because the replays are important. Um, so that's actually how things are working. Again, if you look up the papers, they, you know, this is exactly how they're doing the backups uh, today to a remote data center. 
Right, so uh, we tested, right? So I, I thought it would be good to like, so this, this is actually not part of this presentation. I uh, fortunately still had like my report from back those days sitting in a PowerPoint somewhere on my laptop and uh, I just like did a, a screenshot of that. So like uh, no point going into it, but what you can see here is that, you know, we were actually running a real edge based cluster. We had an application server. We simulated like 12 million users with some standard workload. Uh, and, and we wanted to test this whole concept out. Hey, is the app server going to hold up? Uh, given a reasonable access pattern, uh, is it going to be actually able to protect edge base from most of the reads and uh, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and this in itself was a very interesting experience for me. Uh, I realized that <laughs> writing a cache in Java is probably not the best idea. Uh, so I'll have to stop very quickly. Uh, Flash, I wanted to not, uh, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, so Flash is big in Facebook. Every time we design storage systems, the question comes up, how are you going to use Flash? Because a few years from now, that's going to be the thing that's going to take over everything. So a few different ideas. Uh, we, we quickly understand that, okay, again, LSM trees, like recent data is clustered. Well, we can put that on Flash. There's a cache. We can put that on Flash. Uh, when the app server throws out stuff from its cache, you can put that on Flash. So a lot of simple ways of exploring Flash. Um, finishing it off, uh, things that I, you know, sort of, you know, even after leaving, leaving the project, I kept feeling that, hey, you know, we didn't solve everything, right? So is HDFS too big? You know, when you build uh, systems in-house, uh, we are better off building things out of small components, but we're here we have this, like, pretty big code base that does something, right? And, like, every time there's a bug or there's some performance or whatever, you have to, like, touch large parts of the code. So we have, wouldn't it be nice if, like, we actually had, like, small pieces, right? So, like, data node, block manager, name node. And one of the things that, you know, if you looked at this architecture closely, you'll realize that HBase actually doesn't need a name system. Uh, it, it has its own namespace. All it needs is a block manager. So, yeah, things are not perfect. You know, I wish these systems were built as smaller components and we could choose best of breed, but, you know, we had to, like, live with uh, what we had. And uh, if you've, you know, seen the talk so far, we couldn't quite uh, cover the cross data center uh, concurrency case, right? So we gave up on the concurrent updates. And... Um, we kind of punted on it, said, okay, well, in future, if we really want to set up a data center in Europe or somewhere where, you know, we want the European users to have the data in Europe, uh, w w what we're going to do is we're going to just, like, uh, federate users, right? So, so these guys go to US, these guys go to Europe, and we're going to ma maintain a global registry that maps users to continents or data centers, right? So then we kind of punted the problem. Okay, so who maintains this global registry? How do you deal with concurrent updates to that and partitions on that? But I think the gut feel we had was that, hey, that's a much simpler problem, right? We're talking about, like, uh, you know, much, much smaller amount of data. The updates are very infrequent. The updates we are an optimization. So if a European user keeps hitting a American data center, it's not a big deal, right? Uh, so uh, we could, like, do uh, globally consistent writes at leisure, you know, and, you know, nobody would care. Uh, so I think I'm out of time, right? Uh, let me stop here because I don't think I can cover the controversial part. Uh, does anybody know? Should I stop? Or... Uh, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, while Anu shows up, all right. This is the really controversial part, right? So Cassandra versus edge base. I mean, uh, uh, I'll try to be really quick about it. Okay. So these systems evolve from different philosophies. Uh, Cassandra believes in a flat Earth. If you look at Cassandra, it's a symmetric system. All nodes are in a ring. There is no notion of hey, uh, this is the stuff that lives in data center A, data center B, or rack A, rack B, right? World is not flat. World is hierarchical. You got the PCI bus, you got the rack, you got the data center, you got the region, the continent. You have different partition properties in each one of these boundaries. You have different uh, uh, latencies. So one of the best things that you could uh, uh, papers you can find on the web, you know, Jeff Dean has this sort of uh, uh, things that every engineer should know, right? Latencies, and you got like, get okay, memory latency, you know, uh, L1 cache latency, L2 cache latency, same data center, cross continent, so on and so forth, right? So, th th so I just wanted to put this is not a not a criticism by itself. This is just a starting philosophy. Another starting philosophy, Cassandra does not believe in centralization. Everything is independent. Um, there are no special roles for any node. There is no central anything. There is no central commit log in the system. So you want to say, okay, what are the transactions that have flowed through my system in the last uh, 24 hours? You'd have to actually uh, uh, read like two or three copies of, you know, commit logs and, you know, try and reconstruct that. So I was trying to <laughs> find, you know, I've been working a lot in Ruby and said, okay, this is like the do repeat your reads paradigm, you know, instead of the DRY paradigm. Um, and 
you know, philosophies have consequences. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's the unfortunate part. I mean, uh, the, the, the only reasonable configuration in Cassandra that you can come up with is this, uh, the quorum configuration would be, okay, let's maintain three copies. Uh, let's do uh, two reads uh, and two writes to sort of have a successful read or a successful write so that, you know, every read and write can have um, sort of at least one sort of replica in common so you could sort of get the most recent write. Now, the, the, the thing you, you would immediately notice is that I've been talking a lot about, hey, you know, we chose the write optimized system and it, which was not read optimized and we had to actually work on a, a cache to envelop it so to, to, to give it good read properties. But here we have a backend system, uh, if we chose it, uh, where we would have to read twice to get a consistent read. Right. And uh, it was just like, you know, we couldn't do it, right? I mean, we were always bound by spindle ops per second. We were not using flash when we started out. So we had to ch choose a system that was read, like, had good read properties in addition to being uh, right uh, uh, throughput. Uh, again, you know, if you go out there and read on the internet, you'd find people still debating whether strong consistency is actually possible in Cassandra or not. Uh, and there's no point in me trying to go into this. Like, my general point is if, if five scientists twittering, you know, throughout the day cannot agree that it has strong consistency, then imagine if the science has bugs, what kind of code would you write out of it, right? I mean, we, we can barely get the code right when we understand the science completely. In this case, like, it's, uh, it's almost unimaginable. Um, the, the other key thing you would, uh, you, uh, that I, you might want to take away from here is that distributed storage is not distributed database. Um, so, simple example. So, uh, you've got a bad disk or a bad block, right? Um, you go to a system like SDFS and say, okay, Mr. SDFS, I lost a block. Uh, can you please, like, recover this block? And Mr. SDFS will say, yeah, you know, I know, like, these three, four other replicas floating around. I'll just, like, you know, give you back one of the replicas. And by the way, I'll also re-replicate that replica onto the failed uh, drive or machine or whatever, right? If you go to a distributed database, they'll say, oh, man, I had, like, you know, multiple sort of, like, databases or, like, trees or whatever that were using this drive, I really don't know, you know, who this block affected, right? So you got this missing block, and like, there's lots of people who got affected. So yeah, you can recover, and how do you recover? You, you, you have to now merge these databases together. And there are very, very fancy ways of doing it. It can be done, it, those are nice academic papers, but the thing is that you just took a problem that was very, very simple and converted it into a problem that was very, very hard, right? And again, you know, like, uh, you, you can come up with the right science and stuff, but you know, you ultimately you have to think, okay, can I really implement that correctly, right? <laughs> uh, and how many bugs would I get, you know, if I didn't? So, so basic stuff, uh, uh, we've got to get that right. Um, another thing that, you know, vast majority of programmers here, uh, in this room as well, the way we write programs, you say, okay, um, read a value from a database, do some transformation, write it back, right? So if you were going to do an increment operation, you would say, okay, read a counter, plus plus, write it back, right? Um, and uh, now, you know, if I were to come and tell you, you can't do that anymore, right? Because if you are working with an eventually consistent system, so I, uh, sorry, I, in my hurry, I have switched back from like consistency and eventual consistency. The, the reason I switched to this was that you could sort of get high read performance if you were in an eventually consistent mode, right? But uh, the, the, what I'm trying to point out here is that standard, you know, cookie cutter programming becomes very difficult in an eventually consistent uh, database storage system. Now, some things are possible, right? So you could take that increment operation and push it down into the database and tell it, yeah, you, can you please perform an increment correctly, right? And yes, that can be done. But you cannot, like, take your arbitrary business logic in step number two and push it down into the database. So, um, so one of the things I took away from this sort of, like, analysis and exercise was that um, it, it's very, uh, you should not try and do conflict resolution at the row level in the guts of the database. I mean, that is just the absolute wrong approach. And the reason is very simple. I mean, even the system that I described to you is actually a very simple system. It's just a messaging store, right? Now, imagine that you were doing something more complicated, where you said, okay, uh, I actually need to make updates to multiple rows as part of something that happened in my system. And this thing that happened in my system has to be atomic. So, for example, if I got a document in my collection, I've got to, like, put that document in like some database and I go to update like three, four different indexes and maybe those are all like sharded differently and are in different data stores, right? So I've got a, like this concept of a global transaction that I have to perform atomically, right? Now, if every one of those transactions is eventually consistent, right, it doesn't help you, right? Because what you want is you want those five actions to all turn out the same way. Either all of them turn out positive or all of them turn out negative. It doesn't make any sense that some of them turn out positive and some of them turn out negative, right? So, so the, the, my general feel, you know, uh, as a sort of a more of an architect hat uh, is that 
you should try and solve conflicts at the very highest possible layer in your system where you can describe your outcomes. And, um, uh, and, and I think this, this is almost like a transaction monitor. I mean, this is the kind of the layer where you would also like do transactions. And uh, this is actually how Facebook is sort of like has gravitated in this direction where we have a team that uh, now works on sort of just transporting global events across like pipes and where, and that would become the, the, the layer at which you would say, okay, we had two conflicting events because they uh, wanted to modify the same key, right? And we optimistically allowed them to go ahead in their data centers. But now when we detect a conflict, we got to like do some conflict resolution and this had to be at the layer of this transaction that is spanning multiple rows, multiple databases, God knows what, right? It cannot be at the level of the database. Jaydeep. Right. Done? Time. Okay, yeah, I should stop. So, uh, there's a lot of stuff on the web. You can find all this. So uh, unfortunately, there's questions. no question for time, but uh, no que no time for questions. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you for that second wonderful talk in today's. Uh, thank you so much.